Molly Yonke, and I direct the Institute for Community and Economic Engagement here at UNCG. Uh, I'm also an associate professor in Peace and Conflict Studies, and so I'm thrilled to be here with you today because this is a topic, uh, promotion and tenure, and also thinking about innovations in, in uh, scholarship and how that's something that we need to be thinking about to be at the forefront of not only uh, our disciplines and our fields, but also in terms of how we think about recruiting and retaining faculty um, and diverse faculty and diverse forms of engagement. So I'm going to do a quick um, introduction of our uh, panelists and then I'll share a little bit about what we're up to. So actually ask Jim to introduce himself. Good morning. I'm uh, Jim Albright. I'm the Director of Emergency Services for Guilford County and uh, have been involved very heavily in a community collaboration with UNC Greensboro around the opioid crisis, uh, something that's certainly probably impacting every community from which you travel and uh, perhaps a new novel approach to the way we address it and uh, we'll talk more about that as we work our way along. And I'm Terry Shelton. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement here and um, got uh, promoted and tenured here after working at Tertiary Care Medical Centers and um, a community engaged scholar. Thank you. So uh, many of you, if you're at UNCG, you know that we are classified by Carnegie Foundation as a community engaged institution. Uh, we are also classified as an R2 institution, and we're, that makes us about one of 55 institutions across the nation that hold both of those distinctions. And so what that means for us is that um, some of the work that we've been doing and that we've become known for at UNCG is around community-engaged scholarship, and especially as we've talked about that in promotion and tenure, and how we've started to look at what does that mean to integrate it into our university policy. So in 2010, uh, university faculty, uh, through an ad hoc committee, um, brought forward to the Faculty Senate a vote to integrate community-engaged scholarship into research and creative activity, into teaching, and into service. And so that, at 2000, in 2010, was approved. Uh, in 2012, we had a series of conversations across our uh, departments and units, knowing that our, uh, our policies had to align. And so I had the great occasion of being able to be with about 100 faculty members who either serve in review of faculty and promotion and tenure decisions, um, or faculty who are going up for uh, promotion and tenure as a community-engaged <coughs> scholar. Uh, in those conversations, we had great dialogue about why this matters and what the future of this looks like. And so what that means is that by 2014, all of our um, schools and college, as well as the departments at all, had meetings in which they addressed community-engaged scholarship, and for a large part, um, all of them include uh, some mention of community-engaged scholarship. So it's these folks who are reminded of Andrew's uh, conversation of looking at what does that actually look like when you get into, into policy. Um, and then moving it from policy to practice. And so uh, I am currently working with a number of, or with a faculty member at University of Massachusetts, Boston, who's at uh, Brown Swear Center as a, a distinguished visiting scholar this semester, or this year, looking at our promotion and tenure guidelines and what actually, uh, how did it get implemented? Was it a yes and? Um, was it inclusive? Was it just in research? Was it just in teaching? Was it just in service? Was it only for associate faculty members who had gone up to full, or are going up to full, or is this something that junior faculty members could do? So this is an area of um, deep interest, and I am so thrilled that Martin came uh, to UNCG and said, let's just talk about this right away. Um, this is a tough issue, and so immediately we found connections between community engagement and digital scholarship as an innovation, innovative form of doing our scholarly work. And so folks often put up a definition of what is community engagement. Um, and so largely what I'll say is that a community engagement is working with faculty, or sorry, with community partners, whoever they might be outside the academy, rather than doing research for them or on them or giving it to them. Right? So it's this collaborative nature that you're identifying the questions, you're identifying your approach, how are we gonna do this work together? And you're also um, analyzing, um, understanding, making sense of this, does this make sense? And so if you think about it in terms of two directions, one is thinking about the impact on scholarship, right? So you've got, we as a faculty are going to want to, um, or researchers, we want to produce scholarship that's going to change our field. It's going to change how we think, right? It's going to change how we do this kind of scholarship. Epistemologically, I can know different things than I'm going to know if I'm sitting in my desk and I'm not engaging with community partners. 
There's also the other access in terms of doing community, of community impact. As a community-engaged scholar, I am absolutely committed to, to uh, creating an impact for my community partners. So the aspect of mutual benefit, we're both in it for wins, and not just for uh, one and then taking turn, and okay, now it's your turn to get something, now it's my turn. In the course of a relationship, of course, there's going to be moments of give and take, but we're really looking at mutual benefit and this idea of reciprocity. So this is one of those um, figures that I think that they added all the extra pieces to it to make it look very rigorous and scholarly, but I'm going to talk to you about generally what it's meant to talk about. So um, these scholars who, um, are, uh, who had published in the Academy of Management, Learning, and Education were interested in this idea of pluralistic forms of impact. So you've got a scholar here rep represented by this circle and symbol, and they come into the academy. If they're an engaged scholar, they say, well, I have about four areas in which I want to make an impact. I want to make an impact on my discipline because I come maybe as a higher education researcher. And I want to be able to contribute to my discipline, my scholarship around community university engagement. And I also have this ambition that I'm going to be working with my institution to be able to change some of these policies <coughs> and aspects. And so I'm going to do some of my work around institutional change. <coughs> I'm also going to be working with community partners and I'm going to be working maybe on a topic around healthy eating and physical activity. And I'm also going to be working, another impact area is my students through my research, through my, my teaching. I may be able to produce online courses, I may produce other kinds of things. But these are my four areas of impact. I'm not just trying to go after my discipline. I've got these other ideas that incorporate the life of the mind and the heart and the community. And then each of these boxes represent different kinds of artifacts. So the idea is that not only am I going to, if I'm working in terms of my disciplinary community, I might have some presentations, I might have some manuscripts, but in terms of this uh, audience, I may have policies, I may have white papers. <coughs> working with my community partners, again, I may have white papers, I may have programs, I may have changed even a law or the way in which curriculum in the schools is implemented. And finally, with my teaching, I may have a, a, um, a curriculum that I've developed. And so this last line here talks about the idea of peer reviewers. So just like we heard in an earlier conversation with Kathleen, who is reviewing our artifacts matters. And perhaps we need to be thinking in a little bit more diverse ideas about not only what our artifacts are and what constitutes this work, and so it's not a yes and do all of that other stuff. You, all, only these count, but all this other work that you've produced over the course of your career doesn't count. And then we're looking um, at who is an appropriate reviewer. And so these things also align with digital scholarship, open um, access, and open science in terms of thinking about the kinds of products, the mosaic of artifacts that community-engaged scholars are going to be producing are very different than just, they may include books and presentations to scholarly uh, audiences, but they also may include other kinds of artifacts. Some of them, we don't even know what they are yet. So this list is incomplete and still growing. And so all of these together, I think, help us understand that community-engaged scholarship and also this idea of digital and open and sort of new forms of inter, in, um, innovative scholarly communications are wrapped up in this issue of trying to push against something that's traditional, and um, maybe Terry can talk a little bit more about the word non-traditional and traditional, because she's got some ideas there. And so for today, um, our, our uh, conversation is to have hear a little bit about a chief research officer as well as somebody who's one of our uh, chief community partners in terms of what is community-engaged scholarship and why does it matter? Um, and then we'll push a little bit on this idea of review and artifact creation. So I wanted to ask uh, Jim to tell us briefly about his professional position and roles and some of his goals in working with UNCG faculty. So why work with us and maybe not someone else? So I have a part-time position teaching. It's very hard to sit back here and look at all of you, so I'll stand. Um, so emergency services really is the safety net for this community. Uh, we're the available resource 24-7, 365, that takes care of people during the worst moments of their lives and we do episodic care and one of the things that I think happens over your career is you try to develop systems of care 
that become more systemic and more uh, conceptualized within the organization. So we not only do that, we do emergency management. I also am the county fire marshal. Uh, so I have responsibilities for building <coughs> compliance. You know, I'm the people that your administrators hate, um, etc. But we serve all of these various roles. And I think one of the really uniquenesses of why do I want to leverage the university, uh, quite frankly, those collaborations never have been explored to the level of opportunity that I believe exists. Uh, the reality is I went to graduate school here. Uh, and so one of the things that was really interesting to me is that when you're in graduate school and you're given independent research projects and et cetera, how do you leverage them for something that's impactful to you? And so one of the things that I did is I had a tendency to gear my perspectives into those research projects and did things like optimization of ambulance placement and et cetera in this community. Uh, and really looked at, at issues of supply and demand. So to, to be transparent, my uh, MS is in accounting, uh, but with a very broad perspective into public administration and a number of other disciplines. And one of the things that I found was that the academic methodology was incredibly impactful for the way that I thought about my industry. And so that was a number of years ago, and as we came along, we had this opportunity to receive some special appropriations to address opioids, and I knew I needed to leverage the community to make that impactful here. And so the first interaction uh, with the university was actually through a very robust collegiate uh, recovery community that UNCG <coughs> sponsors called Spartan Recovery. And so one of the things that, uh, that happened is I started interacting with the faculty and staff associated with that program, met the students, started to have conversations around recovery, and then when dollars came forth for opportunities for response, I immediately came back to the campus to have that conversation. And very quickly, <coughs> was guided towards here. And uh, so one of the things I, I had an opportunity to do is make a pitch on behalf of the county to say, how can we leverage these dollars to maximize benefit to this community? <coughs> Uh, I met with Terry and it was very evident she had a number of ideas. Uh, if I sent the money to her, right, we could make this work. Um, I can spend money. Yeah, she can, she can spend money. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, what it did is that it started to draw in resources around the issue and around the university community that I didn't know existed. And I think what we will talk about later is conceptually how have we operationalized that and what are those kind of nuances that we've been able to bring in? Uh, and then how did we structure this? And you know, one of the things Terry and I often talk about is a lot of times when you approach a university, and I'm coming from government, right? There is a lot of bureaucracy. And uh, how do we get to yes? Uh, because the reality is we could have been told no in a number of different forums. And one of the things I think we did very successfully here is that we had a central issue in this community. We had people dying. And when I came and said, we need to do something about this, the speed in which we implemented it is not the speed of government and not the speed of a university. Okay, so that being said, and, and we'll certainly talk about that a bit more. And Jim, can you tell me a little, or tell us a little bit more about the, um, the role that you played in the, that project? Yeah, so, <laughs> Uh, I became the grant recipient from the state uh, of a special appropriation. Uh, I became the, the lead negotiator uh, in this particular project and I serve on the executive steering committee. Uh, so the representation of this particular program is the county manager and myself. Uh, it's Terry uh, from the, the MHRA process and then Stephen Sills uh, who operationally has control of this particular program. Uh, and we've had a lot of interesting dialogue. We also have a working committee. Uh, so I spent the morning this morning uh, working with that group uh, so that we've operationalized it in one portion of the university and we're researching it in another. Uh, so I've served as kind of the key point of contact for that. I'm also the budget officer for the event. So uh, I'm the one that carries the dollars. Somehow that accounting degree, I can't leave behind me. Uh, so I'm the one responsible for making sure that uh, there's public transparency and et cetera and, uh, and coordinate that as well. Thanks. So I think it's important to highlight the, um, the role of the partners here, that they really, um, in deep ways, are collaborators. Um, and welcome to you, to 
and leaders and some of this work, and so we'll dig into that a little bit more. But I wanted to ask Terry to, to share a few words, a little bit about uh, her her view. So she has her own experience as a Canadian Age scholar, but also as the chief research officer on our campus. Uh, she's dedicated her career to conducting, supporting, attracting funding for, and advocating for community-engaged scholarship. And so from your perspective, Terry, what are some common types or products of deliverables that have been generated through this scholarly work? So you might even speak to some of the things that Jim's been a part of. Yeah. So uh, I was a little bit like walking down memory lane listening to our two speakers. So having come from uh, 15 years at a tertiary care medical center where I got, um, we didn't have tenure, but we have promotion and getting promoted through pediatrics and psychiatry and what counted for which one and needing to document on an interdisciplinary project what your unique contribution was. Um, I, I learned some tricks of the trade um, and it was very interesting to see some of the things that were important at, at that point. Um, uh, having that and coming to UNCG in 95 and starting off not in a faculty position, by the time um, I decided to get um, and was lucky enough to get a faculty position, going up for promotion to uh, full and tenure at the same time and on a fast track because I said either you get what I do or you don't. Um, I, um, you know, came and um, at that time it was way before the community engaged guidelines and so um, there was an opportunity to go up through the traditional route or an applied route. And I had a very similar experience where they said, well, we're not really sure. No one's come up through the applied route, so why don't you give us a list of recommenders on the regular route and a list of recommenders on the applied route? And I said, sure, knock yourself out. And it became apparent uh, fairly early on that this was going to be a very stilted process, so they merged it back together again. Um, there were a lot of community engaged examples, if I'm honest. The fact that I had a book and an R01 grant from NIMH probably didn't hurt. Uh, but I think your point, Andrew, about uh, not dealing with it until you have to deal with it. And so they gave me the choice. Do you want to go up the traditional route or do you want to go up the applied route? And I said, I want to go up the applied route because of this, many of the same reasons that you talked about. And so when the opportunity came to work on the task force for the community engaged guidelines, I was thrilled because it creates some space. And for me, it was easy to push the button a little bit, but I thought about all of the other folks that would come along that may not be as old and battered as I was, and um, they shouldn't have to do this, and we're continuing to make that work. Um, when I think about uh, the metrics of, um, you know, in my own career, and I'll give one quick example, um, I think um, all of the things that Kathleen talked about are, are spot on, and in fact, as I was sitting here for the first time, I thought, you know, we use traditional and non-traditional because it, everybody understands what we're talking about. But I sort of made a personal commitment. I'm not going to use that anymore. Because when we say non-traditional, out the gate, we have already said lesser than. And so um, I think, you know, maybe as an institution here, if we can make that commitment, we'll start with, with that. But a couple of things we've been... Um, uh, that I've been thinking about, um, kind of piggybacking on what Kathleen said, or what are your values? And when I wrote my statement, um, and I kept, continued to think about my career, I've thought about the values that have woven through, and I think these are some things that can fit for community-engaged scholars. So access, um, you know, and that's been a big part of um, my work, and I think of community-engaged scholars access to services in a timely way, access to um, information, so uh, open access, the degree to which you're making your um, uh, databases available, uh, your manner of doing work so that other people can take a look at it, access to voice. So an important part of um, uh, my work has been um, giving voice to folks that are usually the recipient of services because that's <coughs> the best way uh, to make for quality services. Um, 
and then quality as a value. Looking at uh, one project that we worked on for the state was a SAMHSA grant funded um, to uh, increase the access to evidence-based treatment for adolescents and substance use and working to improve the overall quality of, of those uh, providers there and also looking at the barriers that moved forward with that. Um, I think the quality piece that Kathleen talked about is so key. I had a good colleague at a medical center early on that talked to me about the requirements for being nominated for an award for the National Academies. And they ask you to put forward your top 12 things. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if that's kind of how we did things, whatever. Of course, we'd argue endlessly about the number, you know, whether it should be 8 or 12 or 10 or 3.5 or whatever. But, um, and he kind of did his work looking at, will this next project bump out any of my top 12? Or will I just enhance my top 12? So that, that issue of, of quality, um, I think is really important. Another piece, and we see this even in, um, uh, you know, NIH, the reproducibility of the work and scaling up. So for community-engaged scholars who are working with community, a lot of times it might be implementing, and Jim can talk about this, a model program. But we're looking at, yes, how we get this off the ground because our metric is how many people died last weekend. Um, or, or today, um, but looking at how do we reproduce that, how do we scale that up, and there's a particular skill set that often community engaged scholars are quite good at, and it's not easy to do, and those are ways that we can take a look at it. And then I also think sustainability. So um, for many of these partners, and I've, I've looked at people's promotion and tenure packets where someone kind of poo-pooed an ongoing contract that a particular researcher had with an entity and I said those people can walk out anytime and you know they were saying it's not peer-reviewed I said like heck it isn't I said those people take a look at where to put their money and if you don't deliver they're going to leave and so it is a different kind of peer and it's a different kind of review but there is a statement of quality that is there that we can pay attention to. And so the sustainability of the partnership, of the work that was there, we've been working in, since the late 1990s in various high point communities, for example, um, doing a variety of things, including working on reducing gun, gang, open drug market, violence, uh, domestic violence, as well as working with community capacity building. And one of the uh, great things that um, opportunities in building this together was to look at um, how we communicate the impact of that work. And so we have all the things that you can count, uh, like 911 calls, and, and but looking at other things like a story that uh, we did a focus group to gather qualitative data about what the impact was. And uh, this was at a church uh, in uh, the West End neighborhood in, in High Point. And um, the minister, as well as several community residents said, I know my community is safer because I let my children walk to the church for vacation Bible school. And the first summer after our implementation of this evidence-based approach to bringing law enforcement and community together to reduce violence, they had um, an attendance in vacation Bible school that was so overwhelming they had to go rent another space. And so I thought, now, how would that look in promotion and tenure? But um, when I thought about it, I thought that was the most tangible example of safety when a mother feels that it's okay for her child to walk in the community in broad daylight, which wasn't happening before because of the random gun violence. And so I think the idea of um, this sustained partner, I think, um, for community-engaged scholars and for our reputation as an institution, we're not perfect by any means, but I think folks that do engage with us understand that we're gonna be there for the long haul, and I joke and say I'm on my fifth police chief in High Point, 
So who knew we would be the sustainable partner? Uh, but I think that there are different ways of, of looking at this work that allow us to tap into the quality uh, of the work, the sustainability, the taking it to scale, uh, the access, whether it's to information or voice or quality <laughs> services um, that we can be able to do. Um, if, and I will often say this when sometimes we get in those conversations and it's sticky in the room, and I go, we're smart people, we can figure this out. Um, and so, uh, but we need to keep uh, working at it. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Jim, uh, thinking about, uh, we often think of scholarly communications as being uh, a book or a monograph <coughs> or a journal article, and we, we use a lot of jargon. And so I'm curious to, to know whether you're reading any of that around, you know, from our public health educators, whether you, you go into those uh, scholar, scholarly journals. Um, or, um, and, or, I guess, and, uh, what other places are you looking uh, in terms of best practices, new research, because as I understand it, uh, you've helped our county be one of the most innovative, um, thinking about not only responding to, but also looking at uh, addiction and, and helping people recover. So let me hit that from about 10 different perspectives. Um, so one of the things that I think is incredibly important is leveraging the knowledge base of the university to teach me about those specific uh, issues. Uh, thoughts of addiction, remember I'm a responder, so field response, 32 years, uh, I, like everyone else, have bias uh, related to response to addiction. Uh, so I had an opportunity to learn quite a bit. So when you start to think of academic disciplines, it was the cross-functional approach that was incredibly helpful to me. Uh, the other part that I think has been super helpful is the opportunity to leverage community resources within the university community. So for instance, I'm in local government. Uh, unlike the university, right, we, we face all kinds of economic pressures and haven't had the expansion we should have had over the last decade and et cetera, right? Uh, we know that y'all are immune from those same types of uh, restrictions. <laughs> but what you do have is that you have intellectual creativity and intrigue. And one of the things that we've seen, particularly around this issue, no one is not impacted by opioids. And so all of a sudden people have said, wait a minute, I know something about this or I know someone on this campus that has some really personal experience with this and I think they'd like to help you. Uh, and so they brought perspectives and they brought their knowledge base and have educated me, which quite frankly is how then I can pursue funding and other opportunities, which has been incredible. I think the other part is the structure. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, for instance, we've done is that we're not being innovative. I'm trying to recreate a program that's been highly successful in another state. But the reality is the other program did not have data collection and analysis and no peer reviewed process. And so one of the first things that happened when we started looking at Colerain, Ohio as a model for post reversal follow up care is that they stated an 82% referral to treatment rate of folks that were in active opioid addiction. Anyone that has worked in addiction if you can refer 82% of people to anything, I am simply amazed. And so we started to dig into that, and what we found is it lacked academic rigor. And so part of what we're doing here is we're trying to validate their process and reproduce it here. We would love to see the same results, but the reality is I think it's unexpected. Uh, I don't think that we programmatically believed in that and et cetera. And so we've really started to do that. The other thing that I have always had an interest in is geospatial re representation of data. And when I started having these conversations, one of the things that counties struggle with is to, to have a robust GIS analyst type positions on staff. And one of the things I found very quickly is, is that that tied to the majority of the research within the university space. And so quite frankly, we got a number of opportunities there. Uh, our local AHEC actually had contracted with UNCG. We now have live an app that geospatially places you in relation to all treatment and all kinds of the requirements and et cetera for admission to treatment. 
That seems to be fairly simplistic. It's not. So there's an ArcGIS kind of background to it uh, that's working exceptionally well and et cetera. That was an opportunity. How do we geospatially re represent our data? How do we make that look better? The other thing is, is that we're so busy being busy, right? We don't have time sometimes to document the work processes that we do. And one of the things that we found is the university really helps us with that. So we're making a change to the system. Let's document the change. Let's document the time. Let's see the system impact. Let's rewind, see if it was a positive or negative influence, and et cetera. And so the research methodology piece uh, becomes incredibly important for us to provide the structure to then be able to say, yes, our program is innovative and effective. Because effectiveness becomes the issue. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens, and, and we happen to receive single, one-time, special allocation funding, uh, is that that's not sustainable. So to Terry's uh, comment earlier, we've got to start building sustainability. And one of the things I loved is in one of our first conversations, that was brought up. So we appreciate the good work you're trying to do. How are you going to keep this going in our community until we see a downturn in the opioid epidemic? And so we've started to address that. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that we received some additional funding uh, last week from a, a different payer source. And I brought UNCG into that application when before that would have been a county initiative. So we were able to bring some additional funding to the university for evaluation specifically and leverage off a program we already had. And I think that's what we see with so many of these programs is they serve as building blocks. And so the, the relationship between the community and the college serves as the foundation for us to now leverage additional resources within the community. And I think the other part that's been incredibly interesting to me is the access that y'all have to funding mechanisms that I was totally unaware of in local government. Uh, so we are starting to see a number of applications. I certainly was familiar with the community foundations and all the other kind of local sources of dollars, but I really was not aware of the large pots of dollars that were available uh, that typically universities, number one, have access to, and number two, have people that actually then guide you through those processes for application. And I think the other part that's become incredibly important for us is really looking at sustainability now in a three to five year window instead of looking at it year to year. Because we have a tendency to look at everything based on a fiscal year. Uh, so great initiative, got it going. We now are starting to transcend that and uh, we did that with this particular grant. We started with two years with the university and our contract, but it becomes evergreen after that. The other thing is, is the reality of this contract was the basis of the fact that the county had already contracted with UNCG through Terry's office for drug court. So we already had a model guidance there, and truthfully, they were very interrelated. So why not use something that had already been successful, that had already been reviewed by commissioners and by attorneys and et cetera, and leverage that for success in the future so our agreements look very, very similar and we've been able to leverage that as well. So a number of different kind of relationships uh, over the years and et cetera. And the one thing I will tell you is we need the academic community to provide that research framework. Uh, we need to be able to answer the questions that you answer in your daily lives that become so innate to you, you don't even realize the process by which you go through. Uh, because routinely we don't have that same structure, and I think that's become an incredibly valuable part of this. I have a million more questions that are raised by this, but I also want to make sure we have enough time for a few questions from the audience. But I, I did want to end with um, asking Jim one more question. And it, so if, if we're thinking about asking Jim to provide a letter to our promotion and tenure committees to be able to document the impact, I'm curious as to um, what kind of letter you, uh, or what kinds of things you might write about, what kinds of artifacts um, or indicators or measures, um, and also whether there's a guidance that you would expect to get from that department chair who's saying, who's soliciting this letter for me. Yeah, so I certainly would expect that conversation early on. So I would expect Terry to come to me and say, listen, I've got faculty that's tenure track. Here are some things that we're looking at. And here are some of the impacts that we believe are going on. I think part of it is that definition very early on would be incredibly important to me. Um, you know, and, and the truth is, and we've had this conversation, 
Um, the level of statistical knowledge within the university, some very important key indicators of our success is we want to put downward pressure on debt, right? So that would, in theory, be part of the conversation for the outcome of the program. But the reality is the instance is continuing to increase. So the statistical analysis behind that, so that we have realistic expectations, I think becomes incredibly important. And you know, in this particular project, unlike many, we are directly impacting people's lives. So the fact that the university is making contacts with folks in their social environment and providing them harm reduction <coughs> strategies and having motivational interviewing techniques with folks and then capturing that information and evaluating it on the back side is a fairly heavy lift. Uh, and I think one of the things that we see is that that structure uh, they've done an excellent job of starting to define that for us and just simply providing that programmatic framework is one of the things that I would certainly write about in that recommendation. I think the other thing that we have to, to talk about is the fact that the university was willing to do it and those faculty members are engaged to do this type of work. Um, because the other part is, do we expect publication? Absolutely, right? I mean, that's part of the expectation. We also expect subject matter expertise in front of elected officials and others, uh, a, a realm most people don't care to participate in. I get to go every two weeks to a commissioner's meeting, most of you don't want to, right? But the reality is, is that for instance, our program launch, we had the majority of our commissioners on the UNCG campus to talk about this program and they support it and the community representation. And I think that buy-in by local government is part of that subject matter expertise piece that I certainly have to speak to as well. And then ultimately, it does get down to some of the metric base. So once we've defined the metric base, the evaluation of yes, no, or maybe, right, is very important to me. Ultimately, have we met deliverables? Are we making a certain number of contacts in this community, and et cetera? Because realize that we have staff working for faculty. So the staff is doing a lot of work on behalf of that faculty. The faculty's then taking that, summing it up, and then working on the publication. So I think all of that would factor in as I make those recommendations. I would probably add, give you some information about, I think, one of the things on those metrics. It is a very collaborative process. So really looking at, yes, what makes sense from the letter, literature to have as those outcomes, but what are those other outcomes that are really um, important. So um, an example, uh, we had done an intervention around mental health services and we were looking at access to services. By doing a focus group with um, uh, community folks, they said, look, um, we're going to get these services for our kids. I'm, I'm a great advocate. What you need to do is to develop like a hassle meter how many phone calls, how much hassle was it to get our information? And I was like, why did we not think about that? We just looked at, did you get it, did you not get it, what the quality of services. And then when we added that literally hassle meter in there, um, really began to look at what worked and what didn't. And so I think it's the collaborative, inter iterative process about defining what is important, <clears throat> what is moving the needle on the way to um, saving lives. And I think the other part, and many of you have heard me say this, at UNCG we do uh, messy research really well. And then I clarify and say it's not sloppy methodologically. We're not afraid to get in and do the kind of work while you're, you know, flying the plane. And so I think there's a particular skill set. This takes nothing away from other folks that are doing different kinds of research. Uh, but in this, in this piece, it is very difficult to be evaluating while it's implementing to come up with measures that uh, are meaningful, that um, change, and really help you to understand whether you're making a difference, and also are not so burdensome that the folks that are delivering the work can't do that. And that cannot happen with just calling in an evaluator to come in after the fact. It is a collaborative back and forth um, with that. And so I think being able to provide that information uh, about, gee, we think we might have helped in this way, um, and then have you uh, take a look at that with regard to the specific faculty member. So we can open up for questions.
comments? I'm, I'm curious about a hassle meter. I love that, yeah. that term. Yeah. What, what does it look like? Can you give me an example of, of is it, is it, it was really, it was really very, it was really very easy. It came from uh, some work in pediatrics about a pain measure. And we've used it with a thermometer. We've used it with, you know, color in the scale. How much of a hassle was this? And so you can, you know, again, as academics, we can, um, you know, argue about a seven-point Likert scale or get rid of the middle and only have an even number. And there were certainly plenty of those things. But the bottom line was when we looked at it, no matter the format, that became the most predictive uh, variable in looking at um, you know, satisfaction scores, but also the child's health care outcome. Because um, burnout for uh, families, um, and there, there was an old um, scale, and I'm not sure it's around anymore, but. Uh, someone else had done something called the degree of burden, and this was because I used to work with kids with chronic illness. And so, again, in looking at the quality of services and service utilization and improvement on that, those types of things, but this really came out of sitting there and talking with families around, you know, we think we're making a difference, are we? And them saying yes. And then, how do we, how do we tap into that? besides carrying all of you everywhere we go um, and talking about this. So, um, it, you know, simplicity. It was very simple. So no one's mentioned the collaboratory. And um, somebody want to comment on how that might enhance community-engaged scholarship and how that might also feed into promotion to can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan was asking about something that we have uh, called the collaboratory, and since we have one of the inventors, I'm going to let her say that. But I'm going to preface it by saying I do think as an institution, if we're committed to um, community-engaged scholarship, that there are institutional things that create structures that make it easier for individual faculty members, individual nonprofits, government agencies to work together. And so I see that as part of the role of our office and, and Emily's uh, partnership and her leadership on this is to look at the kinds of structures, whether it's finding an agreement that has already been approved by legal that may speed some things through um, or looking at the establishment of relationships. Um, we have recently been approved to be a Metro Lab. Uh, there are 40 of those collaborations between a university and um, a city or county jurisdiction across the country, and we're the third one in North Carolina. Um, that provides a framework, and the collaboratory is a very important piece in being able to not only to tell our stories, but also then to spur some research. So I'm going to let Emily talk about her baby. Sure. So, so the collaboratory was uh, born as a um, research, or uh, sorry, a, a relational database um, about five years ago when the provost at the time convened a group of center directors, um, institute directors, and other faculty who uh, do a lot of work out uh, to support research outside of the, the walls of the academy um, to say what is it that we can do to help the university, or sorry, the residents of North Carolina fall back in love with UNCG essentially. Because there's this issue of um, public accountability for our engaged scholarship or our, our activities, our contributions to the public as a public institution. And so they were saying, that's really great, so tell us more about that rather than, uh, and we could no longer say, well, trust us. So the idea of the collaboratory is that it allows um, us to capture um, act at the activity level what it is that faculty and staff are doing with community partners um, and also through public service, the more unilateral direction. Part of that work um, is, uh, so the, the, the database is in a soft uh, launch right now, soft opening if you're in the restaurant industry, in which we're <coughs> collecting um, activity records from faculty and staff across the campus and we will be launching more publicly um, sharing collaborative stories uh, with university relations. The way that we'll be using this in our um, work as, facu as uh, for faculty and researchers and staff 
is to, uh, a few ways. One is um, getting the word out more about what we're doing, and that's important for faculty recruitment as well as for uh, thinking about retention. So in terms of recruitment, about a third of our faculty are of retirement age. Uh, we are similar to the rest of the nation in which we are actively needing to recruit new faculty. And many of these faculty we want are faculty of color and also women who are underrepresented in other uh, disciplines. As well as faculty who are on those edges of digital scholarship and innovative forms of communication and uh, knowledge production. And so how are we signaling to them that we're doing this work? And not only that, hey, go look at our PNT policy, which doesn't have much about digital um, and other scholarly forms, we're, we're doing pretty well in uh, communication. <coughs> but how do we signal to them that not only can you come here um, and do, you do this, you can be successful at this. So part of this, what we found in the early launch of the collaboratory is that I would actually have faculty who come into my office and say, I came here because <coughs> of the collaboratory at that time was up online. And they could start to see their life of the mind here as connected to community, as connected to other folks. And one of the persons in my office during our interview said, hey, I noticed this particular faculty member is working with this particular community. Do you think that they would help me gain access for my research? And that person now is an engaged scholar here at UNCG. It also allows us to receive, uh, the collaboratory allows us to receive um, with confidence, requests from community partners who say, hey, we have a question that we think UNCG researchers might be interested that you can help us with. So one was around partners ending homelessness, thinking about rapid rehousing. And so we were able to look through the collaboratory as well as through other areas to see who are the faculty who are already engaged in those topical areas, uh, who already have shown a commitment to a partnership uh, that we could invite to this conversation about what is it that, how might we respond and, and think about this question. And so that's something that Stephen Sills ultimately um, did carry forward uh, in an interdisciplinary disciplinary research way. So in terms of the collaboratory, um, what we're trying to do is understand who is doing what, where, with whom, to what ends as it relates to community engagement. And there's, there'll be a number of ways that we hope to engage with uh, faculty, not only in recruiting, but also thinking about um, sharing their stories, helping them to connect to others. Because we also know, if I had another time for a slide, what we know from that Kochi um, Research Center at, at Harvard, that faculty are now coming to the academy expecting to be innovative. They're expecting to collaborate. They're expecting to work on uh, big issues, the wicked problems, and they're expecting to do that through interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary ways. And so if we're gonna be recruiting these folks, we need to be not only signaling to them, but recruiting them. Thank you for that question, Daniel. Why don't we thank our panelists?